Hey everybody, welcome to our uh, webinar here for taxes, risk, and fees and the effect that they're gonna have on retirement income. Uh, I'm Brian Wilson and with me is our tax attorney, uh, Daniel Rasby, and Hello. we are excited to uh, join you for this uh, webinar. So Daniel, before we jump in, uh, quickly, I always thought you had to take risk in your portfolio in order to get the returns that you wanted. Well, sometimes that's true, but in fact, the opposite can also be true. More risk can actually have a, a negative impact. You may have a lot better return with no risk at all. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. We'll talk about that as we go forward here. Okay. And then and what about fees? I think most people uh, are under the uh, assumption that they're paying around 1% in fees. How, how does that really affect retirement income? Well, even a 1% annual fee can eat away 31% of your growth over time. That's significant. Yeah, 31%. It's a huge chunk of your savings. And you're the tax attorney. How yes. much can you really save us in taxes? Well, most of our clients were able to save over a million dollars in taxes by working with us. So we'll definitely uh, show you some of that today, and then you can meet with us one-on-one -on -one to learn more. So this could be a million-dollar webinar for someone. It could be. It could be. All right. Well, great. Well, let's uh, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Brian Wilson. Uh, you see me with my family and my uh Four kids, my beautiful wife. I uh, already have two in college, so you know that I am uh, already working on that retirement plan myself. <laughs> yes, and this is me and my wife, Alicia. I'm, Dan I'm Daniel Rasby. Uh, this is me and my wife. We have a couple of kids uh, just getting started with our family, but I was the oldest of 13 kids growing up, so you know, I'm used to large families, so maybe we'll have more. We'll see. You'll be there soon. <laughs> yes, and uh, our companies, we have two firms, Higher Ground Financial Group and Higher Ground Legal. So Higher Ground Financial Group is the retirement planning, income planning, risk management firm. And then Higher Ground Legal is my law firm where we deal with uh, um, estate planning and especially tax planning. <coughs> Excuse me. And it says 99% virtual. It's really uh, basically 100% virtual. We do a couple uh, in-person events from time to time around the country, but mostly it's uh, virtual. All of our uh, clients, are they're all over the place, you know. From, from Tennessee to California to Maryland to you know, Colorado, New York, and Florida. The world has gone virtual, it feels like, in the last couple of years. Exactly. So when you uh, want to meet with us, you can just click the link and make an appointment. It'll be a, a Zoom call, and, and we'll be happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one at that point. So what do we do for our clients? We really try to minimize or eliminate the three biggest killers to retirement, which are taxes, risk, and fees. If you can get rid of those or reduce them as much as possible, everything else increases. So risk, fees, and taxes, taking care of those really impacts everything else. It can increase your retirement income, increase your protection, help you pass more to your family. We are fiduciaries. Mm -hmm. That means anything we discuss has to be in your best interest. Any recommendations have to be in your best interest. However, this webinar is not fiduciary advice. It's no, it's just not. general information. Hopefully you get some value out of it, but you need to talk to a fiduciary to give you specific information for your family. And when we put together a plan, we want to show you what a difference it makes with us versus without us. Right now, out there on your own, your life expectancy is like here. With me, it's here. Without me, here. With me, without me. With me, without me. So, I wouldn't uh, advise going home, but you know, it's up to you. <laughs> so, this is not your life expectancy, but your money's life expectancy. This is a funny movie, Night and Day. Uh, Tom Cruise is always always a laugh there. Um, so with us versus without us, hopefully you'll see what a difference it can make w with us in your plan. So anybody recognize this guy? Put in the comments if you know who this is by just a small picture. Oh, uh, I see a couple of the comments already. I think, data, they, think they know. Data, yes. Commander Some Data. Some fans in here. From Star Trek. If you're a Star Trek fan like I am, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. And uh, you'll notice that this is the android Data from Star Trek. Um, now, the first picture was only insufficient data. Aha. Aha. <laughs> if you, you're not a very big Star Trek fan, you may only have insufficient data to make the conclusion. So insufficient data can lead to poor choices in retirement as well. And we want to give you the proper tools to make good decisions. So what, what, what is this, Daniel? What, what, what is this? This is a tin can. So it's a tin can. And so how does this relate to retirement? Well, 
the invention of the tin can, right? It was, Abs absolutely. It was so the tin can was invented or was actually invented for uh, Napoleon's army as they were going on their conquests. And Napoleon needed a way to transport food, to carry food, the further they got from home base. So he had a contest, if you will, uh, for someone to invent a way for them to carry it. And you see it's very rudimentary. And to open it back then, they may have used a, a hammer and a chisel because... There was nothing There's that no, they used the to op open it. The can opener wasn't invented until almost 50 years later. 50 years later. So, I mean, people were hacking at it with hammer and chisel. You know, it's a very it's kind of like your retirement money, right? You spend all of this time putting money into your savings account. And when you want to take it out, you want to take it out in an efficient manner, not right. just haphazardly, uh, you know, with a knife and chisel. So you want, to, you want to be very precise in how you take it out because that will impact risk, taxes, and fees, uh, as you already mentioned. Yes. So we want to be able to access your money with the least amount of risk, fees, and taxes. And we'll talk about that. So here's the agenda. We'll talk about a quick market update to start with. We're going to focus on taxes, talk about the new tax laws, overview, other retirement pitfalls relating to taxes, and we'll talk about estate planning and how that uh, is impacted by taxes. And we'll have time for question and answer, most likely, not so much today, but when you meet with us, you can do a one-on-one -on -one time frame. So go ahead and click the link to schedule that uh, at your convenience. So we had a bear market in 2022. What is a bear market? A bear market is when you lose at least 20% from the, from the market high, right? So 2022 was a really bad year. And then conversely, 2023 was a really good year. And if you did not take any money out at all, then you probably recovered about to where you were after two years at the end of 2023. And so bear markets can really impact retirement if you're taking money out. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, what's going to happen in the future? Who knows? There's really uh, good predictions and really terrible predictions. So we'll see that as we move forward. But that's the most recent thing you may have been remembering about the market is we had a, a bad year in 2022 and then a good year in 2023. Inflation. This is a word you've probably never heard before, right? <laughs> it's, Not in the last couple of years. Yeah, so inflation is a really big thing on everybody's mind right now. And one thing you can use to your advantage for inflation in retirement is rental properties. Notice that rent inflation was 39% over a two-year period in, in Miami. That is striking. Really, it's, but it's really useful because if you have a fixed-rate mortgage then and you own rental property then your rents go up every year with inflation, but your mortgage and your other expenses stay relatively the same. And that can really be a good inflation hedge in retirement, one of the best, in fact. So I'm a big fan of using rental properties to help retirement income. Okay. And then bond market has not been doing so well over the last couple of years, and it, which is kind of counterintuitive because interest rates are going up. So why are bonds going down? Well, as the value of the bonds, let's say you purchased a bond at 3%, six months ago, but today's bonds are 4%, well, then the bonds that you purchased six months ago are not as valuable as the bonds today. So if I'm going to go buy a bond, I'm not going to buy yours. I'll buy a new one. You're going to buy a new one. And, and if you're in a bond fund, those bond funds have purchased older bonds. So you're kind of locked in, which means the value is not what you thought it was going to be. Exactly. So traditionally, when the market has been very volatile, people move to bonds, they think it's more safety. But with interest rates the way they are, that's kind of impacting the bonds as well. And, and a lot of the bond funds are losing money. Absolutely. And this is uh, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Is he still the res is he still chairman? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, maybe he shouldn't be. These are some quotes from him, right? These are some quotes. I mean, in 21, he said inflation was temporary. But then in July of 2022, he said, we now better understand how little we understand about inflation. And that is shocking coming from the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Yes, yeah, so it, it's it's all manipulated, manipulated. They're trying to fix it, but it's not always having the desired effect. So we'll see what they do in the future. There's been a, a lot of uh, rate increases, maybe some decreases, uh, maybe some more coming, but w w eventually they're going to have to keep raising interest rates if the inflation is maintained. That's right. And if you see by this chart, this kind of looks like the market for the last 20 years. And those drops are kind of similar to what happened in the S&P, but this is actually the Federal Reserve interest rate. And you see they were raising it until early 2000. Then the market crashed, and so they were forced to drop rates considerably. 
and then they stayed low for a little bit, but then they raised, 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 and then the market crashed again. So they dropped the interest rates, and they stayed low for a very long time because it was a really big crash, and they started to raise again. And then the COVID crash happened, and that dropped rates again, but then they put a whole bunch of money into the economy to boost it, and that caused a lot of inflation, so they started raising interest rates again. And they haven't really had a significant drop yet. And I think they're waiting for the market to really crash in order to drop the rates. Until that happens, inflation is going to continue. Maybe less or more, but it's still going to continue. Inflation is still above the Fed target rate as of the recording of this webinar. So who knows what will happen? Exactly. And so what's coming up? You know, Harry Dent says there could be an 86% drop this year. Uh, and that was in October of 2023, Harry predicted this. Yes. And he's saying for 2024, there could be an 86% drop. Um, or whenever it happens, it's it's going to be a really big crash. It'll be the crash of a lifetime. You know, Morgan Stanley is saying the upcoming commercial real estate crash will be worse than 2008. So how is commercial real estate impacted? Well, commercial real estate, well, first of all, residential real estate is what drove the crash in 2008. Yes. Uh, and commercial real estate was re relatively unscathed. Uh, since COVID, we've had most people uh, leaving office buildings, working from home, remote work, much like we're doing nowadays. Remote work has kind of taken over. So there's fewer people going into offices. There's fewer need for that office space. And so landlords are looking at their tenants saying, hey, we would like for you to renew. And tenants are saying, we don't have a need for this space anymore. We don't actually have need for your building anymore. And landlords are looking at, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to hold on to this uh, commercial building and convert it, or am I going to give it back to the bank? So a lot of those conversations are happening right now uh, and as we go through 2024. But, but over the long term, the market's going to go up. We'll be fine, right? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> You'll have the, the only thing we really know is there will be good years and there will be bad years coming up. Mm. And so the question is, what do you do with the bad years? Imagine you get a cut on your arm and blood is gushing out. And so we rush you to the hospital and the doctor gets ready to stitch you up. And you say, no, no, doctor, wait. I want the blood to come back in my arm first and then stitch me up. That, well, that would be ridiculous. Yeah, the, the priority is stop the bleeding, right? Stop the bleeding. And if you need a transfusion afterward, we can give you a transfusion. But stop the bleeding. In fact, uh, famous investor Warren Buffett, that rule number one is don't lose money. You can look it up. Google Warren Buffett rule number one is don't lose money. In fact, rule number two is never forget rule number one. So it's really important <laughs> don't lose money especially if you have to access that money. So there's something called sequence of returns risk. It's a little hard to see on your, on your screen here, but hopefully you can uh, follow along. Let's look on the left side. This is the S&P 500 from 2000 to 2019. So if you retired in 2000 and you wanted to pull out 4%, because your advisor told you 4% is a good number to pull out, plus a little bit of inflation, and you started with $100,000, the market had three bad years in a row. And there were a lot of good years afterward, but because of the bad years early on, you never recover. So by the time the 19 years are up, you're at, or 20 years are up, you have $8,000 left in your account. So you're thinking, I got to go back to work. But now look at the right side. We, we changed the order of the returns. It's the same returns, but we flipped them. The three bad years, we put those at the end. And the good years, we put them at the beginning. And now look, same amount of money you took out. You still have you have hundred twenty thousand dollars at the end instead of hundred, so you have more money twenty years later than you started with instead of being completely out of money, and it's really important when those bad years come, and if you're insulated from the bad years, then you can afford not to take money out of the market in the bad years and and let it recover. You know, those of you who experienced the bear market in twenty twenty two a couple years ago, if you did not take any money out, then you might now be back to where you were two years ago or uh, more than two years ago. But if you had to take money out, you may still be recovering for a long time to come. So that's that's the uh, uh, important thing to remember about sequence of returns. The order of the bad years really matters. So have a good plan for what to do in the bad years. And the, the market... Uh, Doesn't every, everybody get a 12% return in the market? Isn't that the long-term number? That's, that's what they say. Um, it really depends on the time period. So let's look at 2000 to 2000. 22, a 22-year period Okay. from January to December. And the market did go up over that time period. So I want you to put in the comments, what do you think was the average return of the S&P 500 for that 22-year period? I see a tw 20, 13. 6%, 6%, 8%. So uh, uh, all, all over the place. But it was really 
4.28%. Only 4.2%. 4.28% was all the average return was for 22 years. And the reason for that is we had a drop of 50%. And when you have a drop of 50%, you have to gain 100% just to break even. Just to break even. And then there was another drop of 50%. So you had to gain 100% again just to break even. So for the first 13 years, there was no return. The average return was zero. And that was before fees and before taxes. Remember, the three biggest killers of retirement, not only risk, but fees and taxes. So all three are important. But just dealing with risk, there was no return in the first 13 years. After that, it did really well. Then it crashed. Then it came back a little bit. But over time, it was only a 4.28% return. Now, here is the most depressing part about this. If you, back in January 2000, had bought a 20-year treasury, you would have had a guaranteed 6.86% return for 20 years. Guaranteed by the federal government. You would have beaten the market. You would have. With a treasury. Yeah, a million dollars in 2000 would have turned into 2.4 million 20 years later with all of the market risk. And that's good, but 20-year treasuries would have returned 3.7 million and had zero market risk. So clearly the solution is today go sell everything and buy 20-year treasuries, right? Zero market yeah. risk and zero fees. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. right. So no, don't go sell everything and buy treasuries. But the point is, what we talked about at the beginning of the webinar, risk and reward are not as linked as people think they are. It's really important to, to take a close look at what you're going to get and it, is it possible to have a good return with no risk at all or much less risk. So it's kind of like this puppy here that the owner taught to play a shell game. And uh, can you find the treat? Can you find the treat? Oh, there it is. But uh, now look what you missed out on. <laughs> now look, he's going to spit it out. He doesn't want that anymore. Uh, reminds me of my kids. <laughs> and this is kind of like the market, right? You, you Knowing now that you could have gone back 20 years ago and bought tr treasuries and had a significantly better return, oh. you would want to do that. But we can't go back and fix that, but we can look toward the future and what can you do to minimize risk, fees, and taxes in the future. And some of you may be thinking also, well, I did better than 4% in my portfolio. Yes, because you invested money. Over the last 20 years, you've been working and saving money and putting money in, and your employer has been matching. So when you count up all the money that has gone in from contributions and employer match, that's the majority of the money you have in your accounts, not for market growth. Individual stocks, some did do real well, and so you know different people got lucky, but the overall market did not grow as much as people thought it did. Um, and uh, some people say also, I'm cherry picking though. I picked a perfect time to show. Uh, I was about to say, what 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 if what if the years change? Well, the years change do make a difference, right? So I intentionally picked a really bad time in the market to show and make that point. But let's look at every 15 year period since 1996. Every 15 year period since 1996, you add a year, take off a year, add a year, take off a year. And the average was never anywhere near 12%. Not only, a single year. Only at one time was it above 8%. And the average was really 5.16 for all of those different time periods, 15 year periods. My goodness. So if you buy and hold for a really long time, yes, it'll go up. But during retirement, you don't have a really long time. You've got to be taking money out every year. So how do you uh, deal with that? Now let's go back even farther. Before the 13 year period, in 2000 of zero returns, we had a 26 year period of zero returns. Before that, we had a 52 year period of zero returns. Imagine putting a dollar in, waiting 52 years, and still having just one dollar. Now this chart is inflation adjusted, but still, you can only buy one dollar's worth of things at the end of uh, 52 years. Yes. So m make sure you have a good eye for what is, is actually gonna happen with your money and how, how is it gonna grow uh, with the least amount of risk. All right, we talked about bear market, uh, bear markets is a drop of at least 20%. Mm -hmm. This is every single bear market since 1929, except for the most recent one, the, the one from uh, last year or a couple years ago. We're not 100% sure that that bear market is completely finished. So, And that's why we haven't put it on this slide yet. But what the interesting thing is, on average, a bear market lasts a year and a half. It takes a while to hit the bottom. Uh, you know, the crash, uh, the Black Tuesday in 1929, it, it it dropped by 86%, but it took almost three years to hit the bottom. And in the 2008 crash, it took a year and a half to hit the bottom. On average, we really lose 39%. And so that's uh, one reason that in 2022, actually wasn't a really big bear market. We only lost about 25%. Um, so many analysts are saying that the crash is still due. That's why the other adv advisor we showed a, a few minutes ago was saying 86% potential loss. 
kind of like the 1929. But it takes several years to recover as well. So if we have another bear market soon, it's going to take quite a while to recover, even if you don't take any money out. And you need to be able to have a plan of where to take money from in the bad years. Okay. So what do you do? You diversify, right? Well, you diversify, right? So I mean, if I if I own a boat, I'm going to diversify. I'm going to buy different kinds of boats, right? If I'm into boats, so I'm going to buy have, different kinds of boats. So now you have five different boats. Well, I got five different boats, so I'm diversified, right? This is this is how I spread my risk. So there's, there's something missing from this picture, right? What, what's missing? Well, we're all floating, I would think, somewhere. Exactly. So if all you're all in the ocean. We're all in the same ocean. Exactly. So when a tsunami so, comes, we're all wiped out. <laughs> everything's wiped out. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we've diversified in the same asset. We have to have diversification, not just from um, opinion-based uh, opinion assets. Opinion assets, such as the stock market, uh, bonds, your house. Uh, but you also want to have contractual-based assets. So opinion-based assets are basically everything you think of traditionally as an asset, right? Your stocks or bonds, mutual funds house or your car is not worth what you think it's worth. It's worth what I'm willing to pay for it, right? Exactly. It's the market opinion. So you want to have those, but you also want to have diversification into contractual assets like the bank account, CDs, money market, things that are guaranteed, treasuries we talked about, right? Guaranteed not to lose money and guaranteed a certain return or certain uh, things to happen in the contract. Rental properties are another type of contract. The value of the property is opinion. It's based on market mm -hmm. opinion, but the co rent is a contract. So you want to diversify into a, a contract-based as well as opinion-based assets. That's one type. And then the second type of diversification is tax diversification, which we'll get to in just a couple minutes. Okay. And the losses are very hard to recover. This is what we were talking about uh, earlier. We lost you know, 20% or more in 2022, and we only had to gain 25% to break even. Uh, you know, uh, oh, I say only. That's still a pretty, pretty that's big a return. Pretty hefty return. And the market happened to do that in one year. Well, that's great. But what if you took money out at the same time? Then you would have lost thirty percent. Or if we had a bigger crash, then the market has to do forty-two percent to break even. Yeah. And that's a lot harder. So we like our clients to be confident that they're never going to lose more than five to ten percent in any given market crash, because that's a lot easier to recover from. If you have a ten percent loss, you only need eleven percent to break even. The market can do that in one year. It often does in, a, in an individual year. So be careful uh, as you approach or as you're in retirement not to lose money. As Warren Buffett said, don't lose don't money. Don't lose money. Rule number one. <laughs> Rule number one, right. So again, insufficient data leads to bad decisions. So hopefully this was some better data on risk to help you uh, have better decisions in the future. So what can be worse than a stock mar uh, market loss? Uh, we talked about fees. Fees. Fees, but if everybody's just paying 1%, that, that doesn't seem like a lot. No. Well, oh, first of all, oh, often they're paying more, right? You, they think they're paying 1% to their advisor, but there's mutual fund expense ratios, average uh, uh, trading costs are over 1%, cash drag. So these, this is not my numbers. This is New York Times. It's Forbes. When we analyze clients' portfolios, we often find they're paying 3 or 4% in fees rather than just 1%. Mm. So that really eats away your money. But let's say you were just paying 1%. Just 1%, and you know for a fact you're not paying more than that. Well, how does that add up? So let's say if I give you half a million dollars, uh, what does that look like? Well, let's say I'm going to invest it for you, and I'll do better than the market. The market only earned 4.28%, remember? Mm -hmm. So for the next 25 years, I'll give you 5% return. Okay. Guaranteed. I'll, all right, guaranteed. No risk? No I'll take no that. Risk. So you're going to get $1.2 million of total growth. Okay. All right, and now... For that, I'll charge you a 1% fee. Does that sound fair? That sounds reasonable. Okay. Now, one of the, the things that often the advisor doesn't tell you is, I'm going to charge you a fee on the money you had before you came to me, as well as the money I'm going to make for you. So I didn't oh. earn this 500000 for you, but I'm going to charge you fees on it now. Okay. Uh, so over time, it really adds up. So over the next 25 years, it's $217,000 you pay in fees. Oh, my goodness. When you put a dollar on it, it certainly sounds a lot bigger. That That's point. a lot of my hard-earned money. But wait, there's more. It's like an infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> what do, you didn't just lose 217,000. What else did you lose? Well, what if I had had the opportunity to invest that? If you left it in the account and you didn't pay the fees, then it would have been earning interest. So let's say the same interest rate. At the same interest rate, that's another $159,000 of growth that you lost because you paid the 1% fee. So really the total that you paid was $376,000. 
not 1%. When you add that into the 1.2 million of growth, it's actually 31% of the growth went to fees. Went to fees. That's another tax. It's kind of like another tax, exactly. So market risk is kind of like a tax. Fees are kind of like a tax. We haven't even gotten to the real tax we- yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really important to reduce your fees as much as possible. And not all fees are bad. Some fees you get a specific value or service that is worth it to you. But make sure you know what you're really paying. And if whatever you're paying, it better be worth $376,000 than whatever you're getting for that. A- absolutely. Case. So here's a case study. Bob and Carol, clients of ours, not their real names. Um, they're 65 they re- retired recently. They have pensions and Social Security, and that's covering their basic expenses. They have $1.6 million of assets, but they're not spending it because they're afraid they're going to run out of money if they spend too much, and they're afraid of market crashes. But they're really sure of one thing, that they're definitely paying only 1% in fees. When we analyzed their uh, portfolio, we found that they're actually paying 3% in, of fees on average, not 1%. So that's $49,000 every year they're paying to fees. My goodness. Also, they're exposed to a 49% crash in uh, uh, you know, a, dr- a drop, $790,000 loss in the next bear market. They'd have to gain 97% just to break even. And this is why they're not spending money. They're worried about that. So we were able to reduce the fees. It's still 1%. It's still too high, but it's a lot lower than they were paying. So that's down to 17000 And then now they know that they could no- never lose more than 9.4% in a market crash. So to recover, that's only a 10% gain they need. So they feel much more comfortable now spending the money, going and traveling, uh, enjoying retirement with less stress. So that's risk and fees. Now we'll talk about taxes. So in taxes, what we want to do is a couple things here, because there have been recent tax law changes that uh, I'm going to want you to speak to. Uh, and there's specific strategies for uh, retirement distributions uh, that can help you uh, from a tax perspective. And you want to avoid... Uh, thinking about what administration this is because taxes will keep going regardless of who's in office. Exactly. So we're not really going to talk about who is or is not in power or who should be or what, what they might do, only what's already on the books. What's on the books already. So first thing to remember is you will pay taxes. Resistance is futile. <laughs> if you can't get by now that I'm a Star Trek fan, then I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I'm a very big Star Trek fan. <laughs> so um, this is actually a good thing. It looks like a really scary picture, right? The Borg are taking over. Resistance is futile. You're going to pay taxes. Yes, we're all going to pay taxes. So what do you do with that? Now that you know that, you can pay them on your terms instead of the government. Brian, you think if if you pay taxes the way the government recommends it, is it going to be the best and most efficient for you? I don't think so. Is it going to pay them more? They would like to have as much as possible. Exactly. So think about this slinky. I have a slinky toy in my hand. So imagine that this is your money now, and as you save and grow and invest, this is your total wealth. Would you rather pay tax on this or pay tax on this? On the small slinky. On the small one. On the small slinky. Exactly. So you should pay tax on your terms and pay as little as possible. There is something to be aware of that taxes are going up in a couple years. Many people think they're going to go up a lot over the, uh, over the long term, but even in just in two years, they are definitely going up. We only have two more years of the lower taxes mm-hmm. before the tax cuts expire. And 22 goes to 25%, 24 goes to 28%, and so on. And a lot of you may be aware of this already. That's maybe one of, one of the reasons why you joined the webinar. But what most people aren't talking about is these brackets we have now are inflation adjusted. And inflation has been really big, really high. So it may not be nearly as attractive even from the brackets perspective, in a couple years. So let's take a look at this. In uh, uh, let's let's look at the married bracket for twenty four percent. So right now, this year, twenty twenty four, you can make up to three hundred eighty three thousand dollars and still be in the twenty four percent bracket. In twenty twenty six, in two years, that's changing to twenty eight percent. But you also lose over one hundred fifty thousand dollars of room. The brackets. So the out. rate is goes higher, and my taxable income threshold is lower. Exactly. So if you still have three hundred something mm. thousand of tax uh, of taxable income, you'll actually go up two brackets. And this uh, impacts you, especially if you're going to do Roth conversions or mm. other things that are going to ca- cause a big amount of tax at once. Because if you're making you know one hundred fifty thousand in retirement income, and you're saying, "Well, I'll convert two hundred thousand to Roth, 
it's not going to change my tax bracket much. I'll be in the 24% bracket. Well, that's great, but you can only do that for two more years. And then you might be in 33%. Yeah. It's a huge difference. So be very aware of how the brackets are going to change and how they're going to shrink. Because you may go up two or three brackets rather than one. <laughs> and then there's long-term capital gains. Many people are thinking they're always going to pay 15 or 20%. Is yeah. that always true? That's not always true because it depends on whether or not your taxable income hits a threshold for you to have to pay those capital gains. So you can earn uh, up to 94000 uh, today and pay 0% in capital gains. And in fact, with the standard deduction, if you add that on, you could be up to 120000 or more of income and not pay any capital gains. But for those of you who have higher income than that, then yes, you'll have 15% or 20%. And this does not even count the extra 3.8% tax, which we'll get to in a few minutes. So <laughs> they like to tax you. There's tax you on tax. <laughs> yes. The real tax system is a little more complicated than just brackets though, right? If it was just the brackets, you can Google those. You don't need me for that. What do you need the tax attorney for? Well, we talk about how it affects your retirement, required distributions, capital gains, Social Security, Medicare premiums, Roth conversions, um, the 3.8% net investment income tax. We have a slide on most of these, but I don't have a slide on Medicare, so I want to talk about that briefly. Many people miss the forest for the, for the trees. You may or may not be aware that if you have higher income, then you're going to pay more for Medicare. Did you know you could pay up to $1,000 a month for Medicare? As or more as a married couple, that's a lot. It's a lot of money for Medicare, and you're thinking, well, why would I want to do that? You know, if I do a Roth conversion, that's going to put me into a higher Medicare bracket. And I'll pay a lot more for Medicare. Well, first of all, it's temporary. It's only during the time that you're doing the conversions, and then a couple years after. But if we're going to save you, like uh, we mentioned at the beginning, eight hundred thousand to a mil over a million dollars in taxes, then paying a few hundred dollars a month extra for Medicare for a couple years. To me, it's a drop in the bucket. So don't miss the forest for the trees. It's okay to pay a little more in one area in order to save a lot more in another area. And th that'll be a theme you'll see as, as we go through here. Okay? So first, let's talk about RMDs, required distributions. What are, what are those? Well, when you reach a certain age, you have, we talked about the tin can, you put all your savings in here. Now the government is going to say, okay, you now have to start taking out some of this money. And we're going to force you to take it out. And if you don't take it out, then there's going to be a penalty. So it used to be 70 and a half, then 72. Now it's 73. It'll be 75. But the point is, at some point, you do need to take it out. Now, so how do you decide how much to take out? Well, you divide the account balance by your life expectancy. Well, Brian, what's my life expectancy? Government knows. <laughs> I may not know, but the government knows. <laughs> so uh, at age 73... And they determined you're going to live exactly 26.5 years. And uh, so you're going to take out $37,000. That's the requirement. If you don't, then you have a 50% penalty. And you have to pay tax on the whole uh, amount anyway. So it's really close to 90% in, in taxes. So definitely take out the required distribution. They really want you to take that money out. Exactly. And it goes up every, every year, the amount you take out. Because it, you divide by a different number. And the... As you get older, you take out a higher percentage. If you live to 120, then you're taking out half your money every year. <laughs> now, you don't have to wait until the, uh, 73 or 75 or, or whatever to take those required distributions. You can take them early. And there may be some reasons that you want to do that. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So then we have phantom gains. So required distributions uh, apply to your IRAs, 401ks, TSPs, and so on. But what about the money that's not in retirement accounts, not in tax-deferred accounts? We have phantom gains. What are phantom gains? So phantom gains are when you, at the end of the year, get a 1099 for your mutual fund, but you're like, hey, wait a second, I, I didn't sell any of this, but your fund manager did. And yeah. in the middle of the year, he may be rebalancing, he may be adding uh, stocks, he may be selling stocks based on their values uh, to help the performance of that fund. Well, he's not going to pay the taxes on that. So he's going to pass those taxes along to everyone in the fund. That's where you get some of these uh, pass-through phantom gains. Exactly. And they can also have a cascading effect and create income tax in other areas. So we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, and again, this does not apply to IRAs, but it's more to the brokerage accounts. Then you have a 3.8% net investment income tax if you have higher income or if you have capital gains, business income, rental income. And that's not really something you can get around very easily, but you should be aware of it when you're calculating the taxes. So now we come to Social Security. Um, put in the comments, when should you take Social Security? You have the choice from 62 
to age 70. Should you take it early? Should you wait as long as possible? What age 62 immediately. Well, 70. Yeah, another it's 70. Couple, couple wait 70s. as long as possible. Most people are saying you got to wait as long yep, as possible. Yep. And if you Google the question, you may say, you may get an answer as well. Wait as long as possible. Wait as long as possible. Well, I'm here to tell you, I disagree. Take it as soon as possible in most cases. And we'll give you a couple reasons why. So one thing to remember is full retirement age. If you are under full retirement age, then you really can't take Social Security if you're still working because otherwise you're only allowed to make $21,000 of income and it's it really can be a mess. Unless you're a business owner. If you're a business owner, there's ways to pay yourself a $21,000 salary but then defer the rest of the income until age 67. So there's some things you can do with that. Um, and the spouse's income does not count for this reduction, so one spouse can retire and the other one doesn't have to, and they can get their Social Security. And uh, in any case, you can't wait after 70 because there's no other increases. So we'll give you two reasons why it makes sense to take Social Security earlier rather than later. And the first is a tax reason. When I heard Social Security will be taxed, it was uh, I was so mad because it's a tax coming out of my paycheck now, and you're telling me i got to pay tax again when I receive it? Daniel, by, by the time that happens, it, it may not be around uh, too, for you to young. receive it. <laughs> you may be too young to receive it. <laughs> but for those of you who will be receiving Social Security, this is how it's taxed. So you basically take half the Social Security and you add it to all the other income you have, and that's called provisional income. And then provisional income, if it's over a certain threshold, either half of the Social Security could be taxed or 85% could be taxed. That means 15% of it will always be tax-free in any case. Okay, so how does that work? Well, let's say, Brian, you retire tomorrow and you decide you, you and your wife want $60,000 a year to live on and you have a choice. You have $20,000 for your Social Security, $20,000 for her Social Security. So you tell your wife to wait. You're going to take yours now and let hers grow. So now you need $40,000 out of your IRAs, right? Because you right. take $20,000 right. plus a $40,000 IRA withdrawal. And that's $50,000 of provisional income. So half the Social Security plus the IRA is fifty thousand of provisional income. Mm -hmm. So the total taxable amount is eleven thousand. Well, let's say I retire tomorrow also, and my wife and I do it differently. We both take our Social Security now, which means we're getting forty thousand from Social Security, and we only have to take twenty thousand out of the IRAs to make the sixty. Mm -hmm. So that does two things: one, my IRA lasts longer because I'm not spending as fast. But also my provisional income is less because only half the Social Security counts. So 20000 uh, plus 20000 is 40000 provisional income. And now my only 4000 is taxable. That may not sound like a big difference, but on the tax return, it's the difference between paying $2,500 in tax and paying zero. And in fact, you have, I have another $2,500 of room in my standard deduction so that I could really be $5,000 a year richer every year because we took Social Security earlier instead of waiting like you did. So that will be uh, one way, there's a tax reason to take Social Security early. Another re reason would be just uh, a mathematics and, and a break-even analysis. So let's imagine this. If you took today at the and you qualify for the highest Social Security possible, that's $2,500 a month. If you wait to 70, you're gonna get $4,500 a month. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. It's like $2,000 a month more. Which is why most people were saying in the chat, wait. Exactly. But what do you miss? You miss $2,500 a month for the next 96 months, eight years. What's that equal? $246,000 loss. So and we already a, talked about opportunity cost. Exactly. Once. So f first of all, how long does it take you to break even with that? $246,000, we divide it by the extra amount you're going to get per month. So you are going to get more. So you do break even at some point. It takes 10 years. So basically by age 80, you've broken even. But wait, there's more, right? This is the opportunity cost you talked about. Mm -hmm. If you didn't really need the money, you could invest it, or you could take it in and let your investments keep earning interest. And uh, assuming 6% uh, uh, growth on that, now that's $315,000 of loss. So now your break-even time is age 83. Why 83? Well, what is the average life expectancy of an American that turns 62 today? Take a guess. Yes. It's 83. 83. <laughs> it's exactly 83. 83. So the Social Security Department is not stupid. They want to give the same amount of money to you whether you take it now or later. So mathematically, it's going to be about the same except for the tax savings that tips in your favor and other things you could do with the money like opportunity cost. If you could have, do something better, maybe use it to pay tax on Roth conversions, other things. 
there in most cases it makes sense to take social security early okay and uh, then so here's a case study the real tax system john and jane 73 they have 60,000 of social security 15,000 of capital gains and happy birthday you turn 73 pay some taxes required distributions $45,000 so when we put them into our tax software, they thought they were paying only 12%. That's the red line. But they were actually paying 49% on a portion of their income. Mm. Why is that? Well, when they took the $1,000 required distribution, which caused $120 in taxes at 12%, mm -hmm. that caused eight fifty dollars of Social Security to be taxable at 12% for $102. And that caused eighteen fifty dollars of capital gains to be taxable at 15% for $277. So the total additional tax burden on a $1,000 withdrawal that was required was $499.50. And you thought you were in the 12% bracket. <laughs> so it's Half really, your money gone. It's really important to have a, uh, a, a time uh, uh, planned ahead for what those taxes are gonna be. And a CPA does not do this. A CPA just gives you, oh, congratulations, you owe this amount of tax. That's right. They don't do, proactive planning for reducing long-term taxes. At best, they'll say, oh, defer it this year. It'll be, uh, you won't pay as much tax. Well, you're just kicking the can down the road. More than that, you're putting a snowball down a hill, rolling the snowball down a hill. It's getting bigger. So you don't want to get the, let that snowball get too big. You want to cut the tax off at the knees. Think about it ahead of time. So that's where a tax attorney comes in to give you that advice. And so if you want to uh, learn more, you can click the link and make an appointment with us, and we'll be happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about how to reduce your taxes. Well, one of, one of the favorite, I, I love that we threw this in here, because uh, we were talking about taxes at home, and I happened to read this tweet a while ago, and it says, my son asked what taxes are, so I gave him a bag of M&Ms, and explained that he has to give some to me, and I know how much he has to give me, but he has to guess, and if he's wrong, he goes to prison. My son was like, what? This is a terrible deal. I don't want this to be exactly. And more than that, you can change the rules at any time. You can just pass a new law. And he's going to give you more M&Ms. There you go. So make sure you... M&Ms that he yeah. may have already eaten. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. So if you're still confused about taxes, hopefully this makes you more confused. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, or at least a little angry. Um, there are there are ways there are some tools you can use to fix that and reduce that. So what can you do if you're not the average person? If you're, uh, you know, have a, a above average in the amount of wealth and savings, and that just means you have more than thirty thousand uh, dollars saved because most Americans do not have very much saved in retirement. So what can you do? You can diversify. We talked about contract or opinion based mm -hmm. assets, right? But that's one type of diversification. And then we have tax diversification, which is IRAs, most people, when they come to us, they have all IRAs. But you really want Roth, non-qualified, other tax-free accounts, real estate, different account types that are taxed differently. Only use tax-deferred accounts where appropriate. And that way you can properly blend withdrawals from different accounts. Every year you can choose which one to take out. Kind of, we, we talked about the market, right? If you didn't have to take money out of the market during a bad year, you have someplace else to take it out, well, that's great. Same thing with the taxes. If taxes are higher this year and you can choose not to take it out of a high tax account, take it out of a low tax account, then you, you have that choice. But you need to get to that position where you have that diversification. And then consider which assets should be held in which account type. So people often get things backwards. When you're going to buy a certain investment, then you use the wrong type of tax account for it. You know, I, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, I've heard about buying real estate through my IRA. What are your thoughts on that? So a lot of people try to do that. They buy real estate in the IRA, and that's a terrible idea in many cases. Well, why is that? Well, it creates a lot of problems such as you have high maintenance costs, admin fees. you got to pay somebody to manage it. you got to get an evaluation a couple times a year, an appraisal. And you're not usually going to be able to get a loan for the real estate when it's inside your IRA because you can't personally guarantee it. You can't contribute more to it if you have a problem, like you need a new roof. If there's no cash in the account, then you, you can't put more money into it. So there, you're, you're stuck. And most importantly, the tax benefits you get from owning real estate, like depreciation and mostly tax-free income, stepped-up basis, those types of things, you don't they don't apply inside the IRA. So I love real estate. I think you should have real estate as part of your retirement plan, but it should not be in your retirement okay. plan, in your IRA. Okay. So And, and there's another one people often get backwards as well. 
uh, some people buy annuities in retirement. Well, and then they use their stocks, they liquidate stocks to buy an annuity. Well, that's kind of backwards as well. Because let's, let's talk about this. Let's, let's say you have a bunch of stock and it's appreciated. So now you sell the stock, you pay capital gains, and you buy an annuity. And then, so you pay capital gains now when you didn't need to. And then the annuity grows and the income is taxable at income tax rates, which is worse than capital gains. So you pay capital gains when you didn't need to, and then you created a worse tax in the future. So that's not really a good situation. If you've decided that you're going to buy an annuity at some point, you would want to use an IRA for that, if possible, because when you do that, there's no tax on the transfer. The income is taxable, but it was already taxable. There's no new tax that's created. In fact, you can make it Roth and then it'd be tax-free. So whatever your asset or your uh, investment that you're going to be buying or, or looking at, make sure you not only consider whether that investment is right for you, but which tax type to have that investment in. Okay. And like I said, rental properties, we really do like rental properties, um, but just how hold them outside of your IRA. And then get ahead of the game for RMDs. We'll talk about Roth conversions and CRUTs. These are two really big uh, things uh, to talk about. So Roth conversions. So Roth is kind of the opposite, right? The opposite of an IRA. You mm -hmm. pay tax now. Pay taxes now. And then you never pay on it the, again. On the small part, not on the extended slink. But I make too much money to, to do a Roth. So how, how, how can I do a Roth now? Well, well, you have options. Yeah, you can convert, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you made too much money to contribute to a Roth in the past, there's no income cap to converting Roth. So you can take your IRA and make it Roth by paying the taxes now. And there's a couple rules to be aware of. There's a five-year rule. Uh, or uh, You have to wait five years or age 59 and a half before you can access that Roth after you convert. Most of you on the webinar... Most people on the webinar are over 59 and a half. So the rule that will apply to you is a five-year waiting period to access the growth that happens after you convert. Okay. So let's say you have $100,000. Mm -hmm. You convert to Roth, and so you pay tax on 100000 today. And then two years from now, it's worth 120000 Well, you can spend the 100000 but the $20,000, you have to wait another three years until year five, then you can spend that. Okay. So that's, that's the only uh, restriction. And there's no RMDs, no required distributions. And the kids inherit it tax-free. So we want to pay a, a little bit more tax now instead of paying a lot more tax later. Because remember, it's going up in a couple years. So let's take a look. How much do you actually save? This is a client of ours. She had a million dollars in her IRA that she was not going to spend because she had other income. She's going to leave this money to her daughter. When we calculated the amount of tax she's going to pay over her lifetime was $523,000 just on taxes on the RMDs. <sighs> Then, since she didn't need it, she was going to pay another $200,000 in reinvestment taxes. And then, when she passed away, her daughter was going to pay $400,000 in taxes. So the total was over $1.1 million in taxes over her lifetime. That's more than the account balance. That was more than, that was more than what she started with. Exactly. Well, why is that? Because it's growing, and then she takes money out, mm -hmm. pays tax, grows again, pays more tax, grows again, pays more tax. So you never catch up. If she converted to Roth... From a uh, million dollars converting to Roth, she paid three hundred thousand dollars in taxes, but that's a whole lot less than eight fifty. Uh, sorry, than than uh, one point one million because eight hundred fifty thousand dollar tax savings. You never pay tax on the growth after that. Your kids don't pay tax on it, so it's it's a huge deal. And you might be thinking, well, that's great, but I don't have three hundred thousand to pay the tax. So where do I get that money from? Well, we might have a solution for you as well on that. So it's called a CRUT. CRUT stands for Charitable Remainder Unit Trust. And a charitable remainder unit trust, if you don't like charity, forget that part for a minute. It's great for highly appreciated stocks or depreciated rental properties. So imagine you bought some uh, a, a property a long time ago, you depreciated it, and if you go to sell it now, you'll pay a lot of capital gains. So your choice is to do a 1031 and buy another property, mm -hmm. or you could do a CRUD. You could donate it to a trust, special trust that you set up for the charitable remainder, and then you don't pay any capital gains at all. Same thing with stocks. If you have a highly appreciated stock, you could donate the stock to the trust and the trust sells it with no capital gains. It's deferred indefinitely. You also get a one-time giant tax deduction up to 50% of whatever you're putting in. So if you put in half a million dollars, $250,000 almost could be a tax deduction. It's based on age. So the, the older you are, the higher the deduction is. And you can take that deduction and go convert your IRA to Roth with no taxes. So that's one way to come up with the taxes. And then you get a pension because it turns into a pension. You get 5% per year for the rest of your life. And if you go to most attorneys, they might want to be the trustee. 
But if I do it for you, I make you the trustee and you pay yourself a 1% trustee fee. So it's really 6% you're getting out of the pension. And then when you die, whatever remains has to go to charity. That's called, it's called a charitable remainder trust. And it can go to your church. But if you don't have any particular charity you like, you could always create your own charity. Have you ever heard of the Trump Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, the Bill Gates Foundation, the Kennedy heard of Foundation? All of it. <laughs> These are charities, supposedly, run by wealthy people, and their families are involved. Their families are earning salaries. So there are things that you can do to, to have your family be involved with uh, where that money goes, as, as different as giving it strictly to some other third party charity, if you want. But the upfront benefits are really good. So this is a client of ours. She had half a million dollars in highly appreciated stocks. And if she sold it, she would pay over $100,000 in uh, taxes. But what she was able to do was donate it to the trust. The trust sold it. So she saved 100000 in capital gains. Mm -hmm. And she got a $222,000 tax deduction, which she took to her IRA and made it Roth. And then she's got 25000 plus a trustee fee. So $30,000 a year is taxable, but $30,000 a year pension for the rest of her life. And she already had a pension, though. So she didn't need another pension. So she took the $30,000 a year and she bought life insurance with it that created a million dollars that was tax-free for her kids so instead of uh, the, the money that was going to go to charity. And she left the, the charitable remainder to her church. So there's a lot of things you can do, the different ways to set it up, that can make sure the legacy is still planned for, but you get all these upfront tax benefits. Fascinating. So here's another question for the, for the chat. How high have taxes been historically? What is the highest tax bracket we've ever had in this country? Keep in mind, the current one is 37%. It's the highest today. So what's the highest? I see somebody said 50%. Somebody yeah, else? 40s. 40s. Yep. 70%. 70, 70 what are we, a communist country? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's been 94%. That was the highest uh, tax we've ever had. Good Back gracious. End of World War II, 94%. And even, that, even after that, it was 90% for a long time. This is often what shocks people about the slide, but what really should shock you is look at the rate on only $10,000 of income. Back then, that was 40%. That's higher than the highest bracket is today. Wow. So you might be in a lower tax bracket someday in the future, but the bracket itself might be so much higher that you're still paying more tax. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Okay. Again, insufficient data causes undue stress. We don't want you to be stressed. We want you to reduce or eliminate the three biggest roadblocks to retirement, risk, fees, and taxes. If you get rid of those, you can have a stress-free and happy retirement. Okay, so real quick, we'll talk about legacy planning and then we'll wrap up. So estate taxes. Estate taxes, there's a $12.3 million exclusion for spouse for the next two years. So that's the time uh, to die and have it be very tax advantage in the next two years. <laughs> but I don't mean you actually die in the next ten, two years, but you can pretend you died. And you can legally pretend you died by giving some money away now, and it will count towards that $12 million before it drops to $6 million. And you might be thinking, I'm nowhere near $6 million either. But if you have 3 or $4 million of assets, it could grow to 6 or $7 million by the time you pass away. And this is the one type uh, of tax that really gets fiddled with a lot. Those thresholds change drastically from year to year. Um, and in, in, in the past, it's been very low, $1 million or, or so. What happens if you're above that? You have a 40% federal tax on whatever's above the estate tax limit when you die. So it's a really big tax to be aware of if that uh, may apply to you. Now, gift tax is the same as estate tax. That's why I said you can give it away now. You may have heard you could give only $18,000 a year away. It used to be 15, 17, now it's 18,000. But that only means that's the amount of money you can give away without reporting it. So, uh, Brian, you can give $18,000 to your son and not report anything. But you could really give 100000 to your son or a $1 million to your son, but then you have to file a gift tax return that says you've used some of your $12 million. Okay. And he does not pay any tax, you don't pay any tax on that gift. So it's important to know that those limits are a lot higher, um, and you don't have to just give away $18,000. Uh, if, if this uh, may apply to you, then you can talk to us about it at, in the meeting. And then there's different estate planning documents, power of attorney, so that somebody can take care of your bills while you're alive if you're incapacitated. Wills and trusts. Why would somebody want a will versus a trust or a trust instead of a will? A will tells the court what you want to happen, but it still goes through probate. It can still take months or years to inherit property from you. A trust is much more efficient if it's set up right, and the it does not go through probate. 
So that saves a lot of time and expense uh, for doing the probate court. Then there's irrevocable trusts, which are for estate planning purposes, and intentionally defective trusts. Yes, that's a real thing. Uh, spousal lifetime access trusts. And then also special needs trusts. If anybody that will receive money from you is on government benefits for some kind of special need or uh, is, you know maybe in the future, you want to make sure the money goes to a special needs trust and does not go to them because that kicks them off of all those benefits. And then there's Medicaid planning, the idea that you can pretend to be poor so you qualify for Medicaid. I don't like that so much. I like my clients to be wealthy, not poor, and then have other ideas for long-term care to plan for that. Then there's CRUTS, which is another type of trust we just talked about. Beneficiary designations, though, they trump everything. And we just had this a couple weeks ago. A client met with us, and he had gotten divorced about 10 years ago, and half his money went to his ex-wife. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, he, he forgot to change the beneficiary on his uh, 401k, though. And so it's a good thing we caught it because we were doing the analysis. We, we caught that for him. But if he had died with the great trust and will and everything perfect, the other half was going to go to his ex-wife. <laughs> and the, nothing his kids could do about it because beneficiary designations on top of everything else of the estate planning is the first thing, the pri priority. Okay? And... Uh, and so it's important to make sure the beneficiaries match whatever your estate plan is. Absolutely. And then there's types of assets. Real estate is a great thing to leave to your kids. Just don't put them all in one deed. We'll explain that in a minute. Mutual funds, stocks, bonds, all of these things, they get a stepped-up basis. There's no capital gains when you die uh, that your kids have to pay. And then there's inherited IRAs. This is the worst possible thing to leave to your kids is an IRA right now. So spend your IRA, leave the real estate, or Roth. Roth IRAs are great to leave to kids because they don't pay any tax. Life insurance, great to leave to kids. They don't pay any tax. The reason IRAs are so bad now is because the SECURE Act changed. This is one of the new tax laws we were talking about. You cannot do a stretch IRA. They have to pay all the tax within 10 years when you die. It used to be you could stretch it out over somebody's lifetime, but now you got to pay it over 10 years. So it really is important to look at more tax-free options. So here's why don't leave your house to your kids. Well, I mean, I have four kids, Daniel. Should not, why shouldn't I give them my house? They love it. Well, they love say, home. Let's say they all go on the deed together, and now yeah. one wants to sell it, one wants to rent it, another one wants to move in. And oh. now instead of smiling, happy kids, these are your kids. And, yeah, I don't want that. And so it's better to have a, an estate plan that explains you must sell the house, or you may not sell the house, or whatever it is, so the kids know and they don't have to fight about it. So uh, other retirement pitfalls real quick uh, to wrap up on. Uh, well, the other task, we talked about risk, taxes, and fees. So market risk mm -hmm. is the any other task. I mean, if you if the market drops, as uh, an, an expert suggested, it might drop over 50%, that is a huge tax on your retirement savings. And you got to grow from and there. And you got to grow correct? from there. Yeah. And then there's long-term care costs. Long-term care costs. I mean, you, you, you may not need long-term care, but you should have a plan for that. Exactly. Regardless if you need the long-term care insurance or a uh, policy for that. Exactly. And then inflation. That's a really big thing on a lot of people's mind. This webinar is not really about inflation, but we have some ideas. Click the link and make an appointment. We'll talk to you one-on-one -on -one about it. And then finally, boomerang children. Uh, well, uh, you have to make sure that you train them in a way that they're not coming back. But sometimes uh, sometimes they may, they may come back anyway. And then we have a solution <laughs> for them, right? We have a solution. They buy can't. the RV, and if they can't find you, although now with those geo devices, you know, find my friends. My I have to block my kids on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that in mind, what is the process? If you decide you want to click the link and make an appointment with us, it's four stages. So, stage one is getting to know you, and it's a Zoom call. So, we assess your current situation. It's 15 minutes. That's all it is. 15 minute Zoom call. And we might have a couple calls to get to know you, identify where all your risks are, understand your dreams, think big. Uh, most of our clients are able to have 50 to 70% more income in retirement after working with us. So think big. What kind of dreams do you have? And uh, Brian, how much does this stage cost? This, uh, this is free. This is absolutely free. It only costs you your time. So and at 15 minutes, right? So click the link, make the appointment. Absolutely. After that, then we move to stage two if you want to. We give you a pre-qualification offer. Remember, with us, without us. With mm -hmm. us, without us, right? So we give you a tax plan, a risk analysis, a fee analysis, an income plan, an estate planning discussion. And at that point, we talk to you about what it would cost to hire our firm to implement the suggestions. But we give you all the reports and the recommendations included in stage two. 
And that one is a $6,000 value, but it's only $500 if you attended the webinar. Click the link. You don't have to pay now. You just, just go to stage one, and you can decide after you get to know us a little bit if you want to go to stage two. We do have a money-back guarantee. So if you do not find value in this plan, you could uh, uh, you know, ask for a refund, and we give you money back. And, and again, uh, we, we are fiduciaries, which means that all of these plans and this analysis are going to be in your uh, best interest. Exactly. And at that point, if you decide you want to move forward, then we'll talk about details and products and services and things like that that our firm can help with. And a lot of those changes are very small. Some of the just little tweaks. And many, uh, most of our clients have other advisors too. It's not just us. We're not replacing everything you're doing. We're making small tweaks. So we want you to get to the point where you can say this. With me, without me. With me, without me. With you. So that's basically it. Like I said, um, click the link and make the appointment with, uh, with us and we'll be happy to talk to you then. Uh, we are, are out of time, so I, I see there's several questions that came in. Go ahead and, and make the appointment, and we'll answer your questions when we, when we meet with you. All, All right. right. Thank you, everybody.